All right, folks, welcome to the last piece of our reproductive unit, and fittingly, that is pregnancy, uh, what happens to a woman's body during pregnancy, and then delivery. At the end of this, we'll have a baby that we're feeding breast milk. All right, so what are some of the effects of pregnancy on a female from an anatomical standpoint? Uh, one is something called Chadwick's sign, and the, develop in, uh, the vagina in some women will develop a slightly purplish hue. Uh, the breasts definitely will enlarge, and their areola will darken as they get ready to produce milk to feed the baby. Uh, the uterus obviously expands. That's the most noticeable thing, right? Occupying most of the abdominal cavity. I mentioned this before, but we'll release the hormone relaxin, which will cause pelvic ligaments and the pubic symphysis to relax, which um, lets things kind of widen out a little bit so it's easier for the baby to get through, and also contributes to that kind of that classic pregnancy waddle, you know, where women, the feet are spread a little bit further apart and you kind of get a little more unstable. I mean, part of that's just the off balance with all that weight out in front, but also the relaxing of the uh, hips. Typical weight gain is somewhere around 29 pounds. It varies on person, depending on how big you were to start with or small you were to start with, et cetera. Um, here we can see an image, just kind of a relative size of the uterus at different points in pregnancy. And if you're taller, you know, you won't stick out as far. If you're shorter, it'll stick out further. It all depends on your body type. So metabolic change is what's happening. Uh, the placenta is secreting human placental lactogen, also uh, called human chorionic somatomammotropin. I got it right on the first time, uh, which stimulates the maturation of the breasts. So getting ready for the baby. Uh, HPL promotes the growth of the fetus. Uh, human chorionic thyrotropin helps increase uh, maternal metabolism by stimulating the thyroid. And the parathyroid hormone levels are kept high. Um, if you remember from our skeletal system unit, that's going to ensure a positive calcium balance. Uh, the woman's body is more worried about making sure there's enough calcium in her blood for the developing baby and less worried about the strength of her bones. So it's going to tilt that balance towards pulling calcium out of the bones and put it in the blood as opposed to the other way around. Uh, physiological changes uh, continued. Uh, GI tract, uh, morning sickness occurs, not in everybody. Uh, but in elevated, elevated levels of estrogen and progesterone are going to contribute to that. Uh, women are going to need to pee a lot more for a couple of reasons. One, urine production increases because of all the additional fetal waste and the increased metabolism of the woman and the baby. So you're going to have to pee more because of that. In addition, particularly later in pregnancy, there's not a lot of room in your abdominal cavity uh, for your bladder to expand anymore because the baby's taking up so much room. Um, so you're producing more urine and have less room to store it. Uh, That's why pregnant women often feel like they have to pee all the time. Um, and then some respiratory system issues. Uh, we have edema and nasal congestion may occur um, because as that um, belly is getting bigger and the baby's getting bigger in there, it's pushing up on the bottom of the diaphragm, which means you can't expand your chest cavity as much. Um, so you have a hard time taking deep breaths um, and, and as well. And then edema, uh, whether it's respiratory or elsewhere, uh, swelling, uh, think about it, that baby is compressing all the major arteries and veins and lymph vessels in the abdominal region. So the arteries usually don't have a problem getting blood down to the feet. But the veins being under lower pressure have trouble getting it back up and past that uterus. And lymph vessels even have a harder time. So it's hard to drain that stuff out of the feet, which is why pregnant women often have swollen ankles and feet and need to put them up. Um, just mentioned that, the blood volume, uh, well, no, the blood volume increases 25 to 40%. And because of that, that uh, impaired venous return, um, blood pools in the veins and the legs, and you're more likely to get varicose veins uh, during that time as well. All right, so pregnancy is just about done. Ready to get the kid out of there, and we're gonna get into patrician or the initiation of labor. So all through pregnancy, estrogen has been going higher and higher and higher, um, and towards the end, uh, it really messes with mood and stuff and can cause a lot of irritability. Uh, weak Braxton and Hicks contractions may take place. Those aren't that's not the start of labor, that's just your uterus kind of contracting and getting ready. As birth nears, um, estrogen levels are getting higher and the high end of the estrogen levels are gonna cause oxytocin and prostaglandins to get released. Those in turn cause the uterus to start to contract. Uh, in addition, emotional and physical stress uh, will activate the hypothalamus, which will, along with the oxytocin and prostaglandins, set up a positive feedback loop, releasing more oxytocin. So we take a look here. So rising estrogen levels from the ovaries uh, will induce uh, oxytocin receptors on the uh, uterus to open up. You get some slight stimulation of the uterus, 
which will cause the placenta to make some prostaglandins. Those will then form a little internal uh, feedback loop, which will cause more vigorous contractions. More vigorous contractions cause more prostaglandins, which cause more vigorous, vigorous contractions and more prostaglandins. In addition, those vigorous contractions will cause a positive feedback loop, causing you to make more oxytocin. Oxytocin will cause more vigorous contractions, which causes more prostaglandins, which causes more vigorous contractions, more oxytocin, and it goes on and on and on, getting faster and stronger and faster and stronger. It's a classic positive feedback loop that we mentioned early on in the year for your very first unit. So uh, stages of labor. You've got these contractions starting like that. What's going to be happening first? Dilation. And this is uh, from the onset of labor until the cervix is fully dilated. Now remember, the cervix is a, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, initial contractions when labor starts are usually somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes apart when women first start to really notice them. And they're fairly short, 10 to 30 seconds. It may not seem short at the time, but compared to later, it's short. Um, so they're fairly well spaced and pretty short. And what's happening during those contractions is the cervix, that tube of muscle that separates the uterus and the vagina, you know, it's about three centimeters long, thick muscular tube, holds the baby in there, right? Um, and that's going to start to open up, okay? And it's going to open up, and it needs to get, and it opens up. As it's opening, it also has to thin out, right? It can't stay the same thickness as it's opening up. So it opens up and thins out. That's effacing. Effacing is the thinning out. Dilation is the opening up. Um, because there's no support underneath the amniotic fluid or amniotic sac at that point where, where the uh, effacing and dilation happens, you get uh, the breaking of the water. The amnion ruptures, releasing amniotic fluid. Contrary to popular myth in movies and things, it doesn't always happen in an aisle at the grocery store. We're going to do a cleanup on aisle three. Um, and then engagement occurs as the infant's head enters the true pelvis. Um, anybody know how far dilation has to happen? 10 centimeters. Um, so the baby's, so that's that's the point at which the baby's head should be able to get through okay. Um, so at 10 centimeters, that's when the doctor will say, okay, now you can push. And they'll literally go in there and measure with their fingers to see if you're 10 centimeters dilated. Add one. Yeah, 10 centimeters is that much. Okay, so half my head wide. It's a big hole compared to normal. So here we can see the dilation stage. Uh, down there we can see the cervix and how it is getting thinner and wider. And on the bottom one we can see it is fully effaced and dilated. It's as thin as it's going to get and fully open and the kid's head is engaged inside the pelvis. Ready to come out. So now we're, we're all set up. The hole's big enough. The baby's in position. And I should mention this is the correct position. If you get an arm over the head, that can cause some problems. But if you're breech, where your butt or legs are going through first, um, then you can have a real problem. Now, if the legs go through, you know, together, like you're going into a deep dive pool with legs together, if you're lucky enough for that to happen, great. It won't be too big of a deal. The arms can come up over the head. It's not perfect, but it can work. But it, a leg can get kind of caught as it goes through the hole and get stuck in there and get flipped up next to the body, um, and that can be bad. Um, make it very difficult to get out the baby. Um, when that happens, sometimes they actually try to turn the baby. Um, they do C-sections and things like that. Uh, to get it out because it can be very difficult to get that through. All right, so continuing the expulsion stage from full dilation until delivery of the infant, uh, strong contractions at this point, once everything's ready, they're going to really pick up the pace. They're going to occur every two or three minutes and last for about a minute. You barely got time to catch your breath between contractions. And those contractions are the uterus and the other muscles of the abdomen just kind of like ugh, contracting uh, slow and firm and hard to get that baby out. Okay, and you're going to get that increase urge to push, we're using your, your skeletal muscles to push more, um, and we call it crowning when the largest dimension of the head is descending the vulva, okay, so right here. All right, so we got there. So here's what it might look like, right, so from my memory of watching this happen um, so many years ago with my kids. So it's coming in there, you're watching, um, you know, the doctor said, hey, you want to come over here and see, the, start to see something. So I'm down there and I can see, you know, with every push, ooh, there's a little bit of hair. It's probably about this much hair too. A uh, little bit of hair and then stop pushing and whoop, it sucks back in. It's like, oh, you know, you, know, you lost some. And then a little bit more pushing and then whoosh, goes back in. Not quite as far. A little more pushing. And at that point, I'm getting excited. But then 
I start to see these ridges on the head. Okay. If you ever seen Star Trek, it looks like a Klingon with those skull ridges. And I said, Oh my goodness. My heart just sank. Um, I thought, okay, something, something's definitely wrong with the kid. Um, I didn't let my wife know. I was holding her hand and saying, it's looking good, hon. Keep going. It's like, Oh my goodness. Something's so wrong. Um, and then, so that's going through my head and they're pushing and they're pushing and the next one, okay, we're crowned and okay, the rest, okay, the kid comes, you know, the head comes all the way through and, you know, the next duck in the vagina and so two things happen. One, this all pops back into place. That's why we have all those, these joints up here aren't fully formed yet. We got all that cartilage in there so things can move to help it get through, but in the next duck in the vagina. So now my concern goes from. Okay, the baby is fine there, but now the neck's stuck in the vagina. Doc, <laughs> it's getting choked to death. You know, young, don't know much. I start worrying about that, and it's kind of funny looking. Uh, the next push gets the shoulders through, and then the baby just slides out once you get the shoulders through. The head is the hardest part. Then everything was fine. Now, the doctor did fumble the baby a little bit, but managed to keep it from hitting the ground. And then he got to cut the umbilical cord, which is really, really tough, by the way. I really had to crank down on those scissors to cut through that thing. But that's birth. Okay. Um, so the delivery of the placenta is accomplished within 30 minutes of birth. So the placenta is what we call the afterbirth, right? And it's attached to the fetal membranes. And you got to get rid of all those fragments. Otherwise, if some get left in there, um, you don't have full separation and the vessels don't close off and the mother can bleed out and die. Um, and so this is a little disappointing. The dad gets to go and watch the baby get, you know, weighed and cleaned off and tested and everything else. And the mother just has the baby. And they put her on her chest for a little bit and they take it away and she's not done. She still has got to deliver this gelatinous octopusy looking blob of tissue and blood. Um, and about 30 minutes later. So you think, Oh, the baby's out. You can be done. No, you're not done. You still got some work to do. Kind of sucks, but get that out all the way and you'll be much better off. So here you can see uh, the uterine, uh, the lining uh, sloughing off from the uterine wall. Uh, and the umbilical cord, you don't want to just rip on the umbilical cord. You could rip things out and then cause even more bleeding and problems. You've got to let it come out naturally. Um, if not, they do a procedure called the DNC where they go in and scrape the uterus. All right. So now the baby's out. What are they doing while the mother's delivering the placenta? What is the father watching, right? So within one to five minutes after birth, depending on what it looks like, uh, the infant's physical um, status is assessed based on five signs. Heart rate, respiration, color, muscle tone, and reflexes. Each of those scores is given a quick, uh, each of those observations is given a quick score from zero, one, or two. And we call that the APGAR score. And the total score uh, gives you a good idea of a very quick assessment on is the baby stable, in good shape, or we need to do something, right? It's a way to quickly assess the health of the baby to see if you got to take it to the uh, NICU or something right away. So um, eight to 10, seven to 10 is considered pretty good. Lower scores reveal problems. So here's kind of how the scoring goes. So activity or muscle tone, if they're just floppy, absent, that's bad. Arms and legs flexed, but not moving, okay. Or active movement, two full points. For the pulse, obviously no pulse is bad. Below 100 is not good. That's, oh, it's not bad, but it's not good. It's not as high as it should be. They should be over 100 beats per minute for a baby. The smaller the animal, the faster the heart rate. Grimace or reflex and irritability, if they're just flaccid again, bad. Some flexion. Um, okay, and then if they're actually sneezing, coughing, pulling away, reacting, that's great. Skin color, pale blue everywhere, oxygen debt, right? They were not getting oxygen during the end of that um, delivery. If the body's pink but the extremities are blue, that means they're getting they're still got some lack of oxygen, but it's not as bad. Um, completely pink, great. And the respiration, obviously not breathing bad. Slow or regular breathing, not great. Vigorous cry, that's what you want. All right, that first breath, what triggers that first breath? Well, as we learned in the respiration unit, it is of the level of carbon dioxide, which causes the blood to become more acidic. The more carbon dioxide you got, the more acidic your blood is. So once carbon dioxide is no longer being removed by the placenta, it's building up and your blood's becoming more and more acidic until you get what we call central acidosis. That's kind of the point where no matter how hard you're trying to hold your breath, you might be going, getting pulled down into the ocean. You know, if you take a breath, um, you're going to suck in water and die. Your body is going to take over and say, no, you got to breathe, right? That's central acidosis. And the baby will then 
take your first breath, which can be very difficult uh, because these lungs are basically collapsed at this point. So they got to inflate those lungs um, and get that first breath in there. All right, so the baby's out, they're breathing, they're okay. Now you're going to start feeding it. It's colostrum, and so we're talking lactation, the production of milk. For the first couple of days, uh, you're not producing what we call true milk, you're producing something called colostrum, uh, which has got a lot of antibodies and vitamins and proteins, not a lot of calories though. Okay? This is giving the baby a lot of the stuff it needs to really get things moving, get its immune system going, uh, get its digestive system going, uh, and everything else. Um, after those two or three days of colostrum, then the, the breast will start producing true milk, which um, even true milk will change over the course of the baby's uh, uh, suckling, okay, um, from when it's younger to older, as the baby's nutrition needs and amount changes, um, okay, uh, and milk letdown is a positive feedback loop. Um, if you want to learn more about that, I'll let you pause it here. Um, there are some advantages to breast milk, definitely over like regular milk. Um, formula is getting really, really good, but there's still some advantages to breast milk. Um, fats and iron are generally better absorbed if it's in breast milk form. And amino acids are metabolized more efficiently than if it was in cow's milk. You get all those, um, you get a lot more uh, immune system help from that. Um, and... Um, especially right away, natural laxatives in the breast milk and the colostrum help to cleanse the bowels of meconium. Meconium is, uh, I don't know if you ever changed a, a newborn's diaper, but it, the first few poops are thick, black, tarry, sticky goo. That sticky goo is colostrum, and that's formed because the baby is practicing swallowing um, amniotic fluid before, giving, before it's born, and that's what that stuff looks like after it's been digested and redigested in the intestines for however long. Um, so it helps get rid of that so you can get regular poops coming out. And that will do it for our notes on uh, the reproductive system. Uh, we'll cover more stuff in class. We can go deeper into things in class if you want to. Uh, but this covers the basics that you're expected to know on the test. I will see you guys back in class later. Have a good one.